Meme Stocks Explained is the title of today's presentation, and this is based on a lot of questions that we saw retail investors, especially newbies, asking YouTube and Google. How to trade meme stocks safe? Are meme stocks a good idea? Meme stocks to buy now? The truth is that you should steer far, far away from meme stocks, and we're going to talk about why that is. Even if you're somebody who's just curious about how they work, this is a great presentation to introduce you to the topic. So we're going to start by talking about intrinsic value, and we've used the example of a currency swap here. So one US dollar equals two Belize dollars. That's fixed, okay? So how much would you pay for two Belize dollars? You say, well, I'd pay one US dollar. Well, you need to pay something to the person that's facilitating that transaction. So let's say you pay them a 5% commission while well, you paid a dollar five for two Belize dollars and net of that transaction, you lost five cents and that's what you paid for the commission. So when it looks at, when we look at valuing other assets, Gold jewelry, for example, well, you have the weight of the gold used in the jewelry. We know what the price of gold is. You have the artisanship that went into creating the jewelry and the scarcity of that. So there, you can deduce a price based on that. Used cars, what Kelly Blue Book says. Of course, uh, the market sometimes will uh, be willing to pay more. Recently, as we saw around coronavirus times, used cars were priced at a premium. Uh, houses, a real estate appraiser will determine, along with the uh, the tax man, will determine what a house is worth. But what about stocks? Well, we did a presentation not too long ago. I'll put a dis uh, link to it in the description of this video. It talks about how to value stocks. Well, MBAs typically learn how to value companies using all these different methods. Uh, basically, it comes down to future cash flows, estimating what those might be, discounting that cash over time, etc. Now, if you have a company, let's say, that holds a billion dollars in cash on their books, how is it possible for that company to trade for less? So an example would be Nano Dimension. They have or had a billion dollars on their books, yet the market cap, the total value of that company was worth less than a billion dollars. How can that be? Well, that discount reflects the confidence that investors have in that management team's ability to take that billion dollars and turn it into something more. Essentially, that that discount shows that they don't have any faith in the management team's ability to use that money effectively. And of course, you see activist shareholders trying to get control of that company because they know that the management team's just going to squander the cash. They don't have a plan for it. This is the same as when people complain about representation in funding. Oh, we need to have, let's say, more women startups funded. Well, throwing money at somebody's idea doesn't mean it's going to be a success. And people fund startups because they want to show an ROI on those. So you can't just hand somebody money and expect that they're going to be able to turn that into more money, which is the reason that we invest in the first place. So the same holds true when we look at companies. And this is relevant in the world of mean stocks because a lot of these firms are getting a lot of money because their share prices are going to the moon. Why is that? Well, now we start to talk about the world of trading. And this book uh, that you see here, Liar's Poker, it's an absolutely fabulous read. If you're ever going to work in finance or if you just want to read a good book, this is one that you ought to check out. And it talks about how when large numbers of people are after the same commodity, whether that's a stock, a bond, a job, whatever it is, it quickly becomes overvalued. That's what happens with meme stocks. And the ultimate value of an asset is always what someone is willing to pay for it. That's very important. So meme stocks typically start out with some hype-based momentum. People climb on board, the hype train starts, and the volatility starts. And a good example would be here you can see in this picture, uh, this is where the bag holders are made. So we have AMC stock. We recently did a piece on AMC that you can check out, a video. And you can see here where that blue arrow points to where all the hype was. And then when we talk about bag holders, we refer to people that buy into the hype stories, purchase 
shares at a premium, let's say upwards of $30 a share. And then when it trades at $5 a share, they've lost most of their money and they don't know what to do. And that's when they start buying things like, well, it must be the, the short seller's problem. And we're going to talk to uh, Gary Gensler and we're going to figure this out. And that's not how the world works. Here you can see another picture that shows how shares of AMC have now uh, they're plotted here against their third biggest competitor, and you can see how they've floated back down to earth, and now their returns more closely represent, uh, represent uh, the same returns as their competitor. So that's how you know it's it's more fairly valued as opposed to the red square that there that shows when all the bag holders were made. And this diagram here does a good job of showing how this works. You have the early adopter phase, and that's where uh, the story starts. And then the middle phase, they start to notice. And then this fear of missing out phase, this is where the bag holders start coming on board. The profit-taking phase is right about peak hype where all the smart money is exiting and making a whole lot of cash, which is uh, generally illegal. You have stock promoters that facilitate this sort of stuff. And uh, a, a number of them got in trouble with the SEC recently for doing this on, on Twitter and Reddit. The reason why there's a proliferation of meme stocks these days is because of social media, and it makes it very easy to coordinate campaigns. So a lot of retail investors will think to themselves, well, I can just trade this, okay? Well, first of all, if you're going to be a trader, that means that you have to be able to work both sides, which means you need to be able to short stocks, which means you need to use margin, which is extremely risky, which means you can very quickly lose all your capital when you're on a short side of a trade. You can look at options, but that means you're paying for time, and you can't imagine how sophisticated the algorithm is on the other side of the trade that you're taking. That's typically a institution that's writing that option, and uh, you'll usually lose. And a lot of people out there claim to be winners. You have newbies luck and things like that, but anybody that's trying to sell you any sort of a, a trading system is full of shit. So there's a saying, this came out of... Um, Liar's poker, I believe. It's those who know don't tell, and those who tell don't know, and they're absolutely right. So there's no uh, system that can work. Another thing that you'll see, uh, the stories on Reddit and Wall Street Bets and places like that, you'll see them talking about short squeezes, and you need to uh, take that with a grain of salt. Certainly, there can be short squeezes. I was working uh, on uh, more or less Wall Street when uh, this event happened. This was when short sellers made Volkswagen the world's priciest firm, and we spent uh, several days addressing questions from our clients and having our research team scramble to put together presentations on what was going on. And short sellers, a short squeeze takes place when um, remember, shorts sell stocks, sometimes stocks they don't have, and those who buy them at a certain price, they then buy those shares back when the price falls and make the difference. So at a certain point, they need to buy back shares because of their margins. Remember, we talked about how risky margins are. Well, sometimes they don't have a choice and have to buy shares at any price just to cover their position. That's called a short squeeze. You'll see a lot of banter talking about, oh, maybe there's going to be a short squeeze. Don't pay any attention to that. It's all speculation. These are the same old pump and dumps that we've been seeing for decades. There's always some bull story which changes over time to keep people interested until finally the shares float back down to earth and all the bag holders have lost all their money. Essentially, they've handed it over to sophisticated institutional investors. There's usually an easy to understand thesis. Almost always it pits Joe retail investor against the Wall Street. Be very, very careful anytime somebody starts talking about democratizing access to wealth or sticking it to the hedge funds. Bullshit. The hedge funds are laughing all the way to the bank. They always will be sure. In the case of uh, GME or AMC, you may have had some cases where hedge funds made some mistakes, and that's bound to happen with smaller hedge funds that aren't paying attention to the stupidity of the retail investor and how high they can push the, the, the price of a stock. Remember what we talked about earlier, intrinsic value. You don't create value just by pumping a stock up. The intrinsic value of that company remains the same. It will always revert back to the mean. So 
what you'll usually see are very shady characters, what we call cheerleaders, propelling these stories forward. Social media, as we said, has made it very easy to manipulate stocks. These are just another form of pump and dump, and they always end up with people holding the bag. These cheerleaders are very interesting characters. They can be coordinated retail investors, as in the case of the recent Muppets that got busted by the SEC. It could be a small number of anonymous individuals representing a uh, firm. They could be paid analysts. They could just be genuine individuals who drank too much Kool-Aid. But when you present them with facts, you can very quickly tell that they're not real investors because they refuse to address anything that goes against their thesis, their sacred cow. And what they'll do is when they find a bear thesis, they'll use that or try to use that as a pulpit for the bull. So quickly go spouting all their bull facts instead of trying to address the bear facts presented. They'll spend a great deal of time describing every iota of detail to make themselves appear as a subject matter expert instead of focusing on red flags, which any sort of person who has a capital that they don't want to lose would certainly want to be aware of red flags and take a second guess about their position. That's if you're a smart investor, you want to hear both sides. They never want to hear both sides. What they'll do is they'll always make accusations on people who are looking at a stock using common sense, and they'll make all sorts of projections. Well, you're short, or you're this, or you're that, when in fact, they're the ones that have sinister motives. So be wary of that. Now, there's a book that you ought to read called Reminiscences of a Stock Operator. It's simply excellent. And I took some quotes from here that are certainly useful. The first being, nobody can make big money on what someone else tells him to do. That's why we don't tell investors what to do. Sure, we say what we do ourselves, but our goal is to make people better investors, not to tell them what to do. Who wants that responsibility, right? Says here, the sucker has always tried to get something for nothing. And the appeal in all these booms is the gambling instinct aroused by greed. That's what everybody, you know, might as well go to a casino. You'll have a lot more fun than you will trying to play around with meme stocks. People who look for easy money invariably pay for the privilege of proving conclusively it cannot be found on this sordid earth. And time and time again has this been proven. So if you're looking for a list of meme stocks, uh, perhaps so that you can avoid them, this is where things get a bit interesting. So we pulled up some of the meme stocks from Wall Street Bets. And uh, you can see the names. So you've got Bed, Bath & Beyond, which is going bankrupt. So that's uh, similar to the Hertz situation. Tilray is a conglomerate. You have a lot of hype in cannabis in general. So perhaps that might be considered a meme stock. AMC, definitely. This is a, a thesis on theaters, which is uh, stale and probably not worth the time of day. I don't know why you would think that theaters were the way forward in America when that uh, trend has been going downwards for the last several decades. Palantir is probably Probably not a meme stock because there's a real legitimate growth business there. And we're not invested in Palantir for reasons that we've provided in our Palantir presentation. Of course, we're due for another look. It looks like they had a bit of a pop today because they surprised on earnings and revenues. But um, uh, we wouldn't consider that to be a meme stock. Tesla, no way, man. It's just too large. Now, what's interesting is that you actually have an ETF. Why? Who knows? that uh, tracks meme stocks. We're not even going to list the name of that ETF to uh, give them any sort of attention because they absolutely shouldn't be providing this sort of quote-unquote investment mechanism unless they're offering it for people to short, but then you never want to get involved in shorting. We never, ever get involved in shorting. It's just too much risk. As we talked about earlier, if uh, sophisticated institutional investors blow up their funds, then you certainly don't want to be messing around with that. Now, what they've done here is they've tried to take all stocks that have a strong percentage of retail investor participation, and then they've scanned Wall Street bets to look for what people are talking about, and Robinhood, the uh, the firm that we've talked about before, which says they're all about democratizing access to wealth, but has done nothing but fleece retail investors by offering them risky and pushing onto them re, uh, risky uh, investment products to retail investors. So uh, we have no respect for uh, Robin Hood, but uh, they've tried to come up with a list, and you can see here a number of firms. And this is where uh, you can't address this 
completely objectively in a rules-based fashion like they've tried to do here. For example, let's take IBM. That happens to be a firm that we're holding. Here you can see a stock chart for IBM over the past five years. Notice how there's no real volume spikes there. There's volatility, but no price spikes. So what's probably happened here is that you have strong retail interest from IBM's brand power. So uh, is it volatile? Yes. Is it hype? No. It doesn't appear to be the case. It's probably not a meme stock. Another example we might give, in when you're differentiating between hype and meme stocks, when you have a group of stocks that move together, perhaps 3D printing stocks or gene editing stocks are a great example. Uh, uh, stocks that move together as birds of a feather, that's a hype move. Okay, So gene editing stocks uh, not too long ago, jumped several hundred percent in a matter of days as a group. That's how you could tell it was hyped. All stocks were being hyped at the same time. We see that recently with AI stocks that have AI in the name. The temptation there then becomes to try and time the market, something that we don't like to do at all, to speculate. Now, if that happens and you have to make a decision, usually make that decision based on cost basis. So gene editing stocks are an example where we actually covered our entire cost basis and now we're playing with the house's money. So the idea goes something like this. If you're holding a stock, it goes up 200% in three days. You know that's hype. Sell half your position and now you're playing with the house's money. If it goes up another 200%, you're happy. You're still holding a position and, and you're making money. If it falls by 50%, you're happy as well because now you can just get back in with that same money and buy shares at a discount if you want to go back to your original position. So the, the exception might be when you have a company like C3.ai that starts to move uh, along with all other AI stocks, whether you want to call that. It's, it, we would say it's not a meme stock because it's moving with other stocks, whereas meme stocks move solo. But with C3, then you need to make the decision if you're underwater, what do you do? Well, you probably shouldn't try to time the market. So just to conclude, don't get yourself involved in meme stocks. You'll always lose in the wrong, long run. It's just like casinos. There are hundreds of great companies out there to invest in. Why would you go trying to look for ideas with rubbish like that? Take it as a learning experience if you've already lost money in meme stocks. And if you're holding a good company, just hope it doesn't become a meme stock because then that puts you in a real interesting position because as we mentioned earlier, then you're tempted to cover your cost basis and then you're involved in market timing and that can uh, be beneficial. But uh, again, that's taking on a lot of added risk. So I've put another video here that you might be interested in watching on the one of the most famous meme stocks, AMC. Please click the Nanalyze logo first. Subscribe to our channel. Thanks so much for taking the time to watch this today.